how is it that they can manage the economy effectively? They don't. They don't manage it all, all well. If you lead up to the financial crisis in 2007, they didn't see it coming. In fact, their predictions about 2008 was going to be a great year. It was just built for corruption. And the whole system, the government ended up underwriting a corrupt Ponzi scheme. Is economics a science? On this episode of the podcast, I speak with economist and author Steve Keen, who famously predicted the 2008 financial crisis. Steve is perhaps best known for his criticism of modern economic theory, which he sees as being inconsistent, unscientific, and empirically unsupported. The problem, he claims, is that economists are trapped in an ideological struggle over where wealth comes from and who creates the wealth and poverty in a society. In this conversation, we discuss the history of economic theory, the problems with current economic models, and the new science of economics that Steve is trying to build based on incontrovertible foundations. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast, supported by the Andrea von Braun Foundation. If you enjoy this content, you can help support me directly by liking, subscribing, and sharing. And now, here's Steve Keen. I hope you enjoy. Escaped Sapiens. What is economics? Is it engineering or is it mathematics or is it closer to group psychology? Is it a science? It, no, it should be um, <laughs> because even though it's very difficult to, uh, you know, there are, there are obvious, uh, you have conscious beings as part of what you're trying to analyze, then it makes it rather harder than mod modeling, for example, the behavior of water molecules. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of people therefore say it's not a science because the nature of the object being studied has uh, volition and therefore you can't apply uh, laws of mathematics to it. Uh, I, but it, there's, there's enough foundations on which you can actually build something which is you could call a science, but in no way does what economic, economics currently does qualify as a science. And the major reason is that the big shift for for science itself was to get away from the belief of the science was reading the great books and then you know bringing aristotle up to date in the 1500s uh, which was the nature of so-called science before the uh, copernican revolution uh, economics is still dominated by the great book so if you want to understand what an economist believes grab hold of alfred marshall's principles of economics back in the 1890s to the 1920s and they still, anything that contradicts Marshall, they don't want to know about. So they, they fail on the very first ground of being driven by observation, empirical uh, uh, induction, abduction, as it's called as well. They deduce stuff from, from ideas you can find in Marshall, which you can date back to earlier economists like Jean-Baptiste Say and Augustine Cournot. Uh, but fundamentally, they are non-scientific in the worst possible sense of the word. I would imagine, just to push back a little bit, uh, to play a devil's advocate, I would imagine that it would be really lucrative to have a good scientific understanding of economics, right? We can do it for the weather, we can do it for all sorts of chaotic and uh, complicated systems. Why? I, I, I imagine this should be the system that we understand best because it's so lucrative. Mm. Why is that not the case? Largely because it's tied up with how what we economics is tied up with what we believe about society, and there have been immense struggles over uh, you know, throughout history about what is the nature of the society we're in. Uh, I imagine that that Spartacus wasn't too fond of Rome, for example, uh, whereas the Romans were very fond of Rome, and uh, and therefore you, you, when you have a a social system because we're embedded in that social system and our views about that social system are driven by our, our position and what it does to us and and so on uh, ideology dominates and economists had an ideological struggle over where does wealth come from who who creates the wealth that we as a society enjoy and the, the equally the poverty that that society creates and that battle's been going on for 250 years pretty much since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. And that ideology, in many ways, with economists of all persuasions are rather unconscious of their ideology. They say their ideology is truth rather than a, a political orientation. But in, I, I see the current state of it as being dominated by 
ideology, whether you're left wing or right wing, and the effectively the right wing ideology is what's dominated the current version of economics. So what's called neoclassical economics sees capitalism as a system which maximizes people's utility given constraints. That's its orientation. Now, that's treating it like something which was designed to achieve a purpose, and it's not. It's something which evolved out of human culture, uh, the capacity, our capacity to reason, our capacity to exploit uh, resources, our capacity to exploit each other, and all those elements. And uh, and that is simply un unrecognized by the dominant strand of economics. It treats capitalism as though it's Society has always been capitalist. You'll feel find people, neoclassicals, applying the idea that you know people were trying to maximize the utility and they were trying to trade and and, and so on. Back in Cro Magnon days, they'll literally predict it back that far. So I'm trying to find a foundation that will give us something which you can't object to as a as a logical foundation for the discipline. And I think I've achieved that to some degree, but the mainstream, anything which challenges the vision of capitalism as a system that maximizes utility, subject to constraints of uh, minimizing cost, uh, they just don't want to know about and they reject it. So I really regard the current uh, nature of economics as similar to astronomy before Copernicus. It's also the case in the public discourse, right? Because you you listen to the way that people talk about different economic systems and some people will say capitalism or socialism or Marxism, mm. they're not just wrong or faulty, but they're evil. Let's say they, you know, yeah. people will say capitalism causes all environmental destruction or socialism mm. led, led to so and so many deaths. People will have even very distorted views of, of what these systems are. Why do you think it is that people become so ide ideologically invested in something that's so abstract? I think because of something that humans have always done. Because I, I mean, my my vision of like the first human conversation would have been two of our um, evolutionary predecessors lying back on the ground or in a tree and looking up at the stars and saying, "What do you think they are?" And then you have a belief system about that which. We then share those beliefs. So I see humans as being distinguished from most other animals, not all, but most other animals by the capacity to share beliefs and to be motivated by those beliefs to do things which without the beliefs you would never you would never take on. Um, so, for example, if you imagine us back as an animal, you know, a predator uh, animal on the African plains 300,000 years ago, uh, the fact that we could come together and collectively try to take on a mammoth or a, an elephant and bring it down for food is something which no individual would do on their own. Uh, only if you sort of share beliefs and say, look, we can do it. We can build this trap. We can get this elephant in there and we can kill it. And we can cut it up and we can cook it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's an incredible level of cooperation, which, in, which involves a set of shared beliefs. And that's practical when it comes to wanting to, you know, fell that animal and feed with the hunter-gatherer approach, but it equally applies to how we think the universe operates. So we've always been driven by having a set of beliefs, and we find that you know we we, we have a we we criticise you know older um, manifestations of ourselves by having what they call primitive religions. Well, well look at modern religion. You know, a bloke two hundred thousand years ago happened to be God, was crucified, got buried, went to heaven. I mean, come on. Um, if you want to criticise any all all of our beliefs fundamentally have a religious component to them. And in that sense, uh, science, the great advance of science, was breaking free from that and saying, wow, your religion tells you that the uh, you know, the um, heavens are perfect. And I've just invented this little thing called a telescope. My name's Galileo, by the way. And take a look through the telescope and you'll find that there are craters on the moon, uh, which means the moon's not a perfect sphere. And obviously something else has collided into it which you know doesn't fit your theory that the heavens are perfect and what's the reaction of a Ptolemaic astronomer i don't want to know i don't want to look through that telescope so the science developed a capacity to challenge those beliefs and that that is what i think is given us the incredible capacity to advance that we've done since the 1500s in our technology and so on um, but the, the the background is that even scientists have beliefs so scientists believe in their paradigm they don't try to contradict the paradigm they try to confirm it but because they're using observation 
observations will sometimes contradict the paradigm and ultimately cause it to change and evolve. That unfortunately does not happen in economics. And that's why I see it fundamentally as not being a science, but still reflecting the nature of humanity. I plan to get onto your economics in a little bit down uh, the conversation, but before that, so that we don't lose people, can you give me a broad overview of the different schools of economics or the different schools of economic thought uh, that are at play currently? Okay, well, the, main, the dominant one is called neoclassical economics. It will also be described as mainstream economics. And that is dominated by uh, what's called microeconomics, which is the uh, analysis, allegedly, of how individuals behave as consumers and how firms behave as producers. And the concept is that uh, the, the firms are trying to maximise their profits and consumers are trying to maximise their utility, subjective utility. So it has a subjective theory of value at its foundation. And the proposition is that uh, you and I as consumers are subject to what's called diminishing marginal utility. So utility is subjective. Uh, the utility you get out of a chair is how comfortable it makes you feel, not a objective definition that a chair is something you can sit in without considering how good it makes you feel. So you, you buy things for subjective utility maximization. And as you buy more units of individual commodity, you get less utility from each extra uh, unit that you buy so your utility diminishes but is always positive as you consume more that's the orientation they have for consumer behavior and we we decide uh, how much to consume by rational calculation so even though it's our subjective utility we're maximizing uh, it's possible to apply mathematical rules to say whether we are or are not behaving rationally so one obvious example of rational behavior is more as compared to less so if you uh, if you consume, if you actually some, like something less when you consume more of it, you must be irrational, and that's ruled out. Uh, so, out of all that, they can derive a way in which, given a budget, the budget constraint is what your income is. You can then state how many units of one commodity you can buy if you spent all your income on that commodity, and then how many of another you could buy if you spent all of your income on that commodity. You get a straight line between the two, of course, and then they work out what's called the demand curve by changing the relative price of one good to another and then deriving a, a, you know, how many units you will consume given that income uh, and given the relative prices. And out of that, they derive a demand curve. So that, And then they aggregate all individual demand to say there's market demand. So that's one side of the thinking. And on the other side, they say firms are profit maximizers. They are subject to diminishing marginal productivity. So as you produce output, you must have fixed units, fixed inputs, largely capital and machinery, variable inputs, largely labor, but also raw materials, but they tend to forget about the raw materials and just talk about labor. And then to produce more output, each, each extra work you add will add more uh, units of output, but at a diminishing rate because of this diminishing marginal productivity. So out of that, they derive a supply curve and the demand curve slopes down in price. So the higher the price, the less people will consume and the lower the price, the more they'll consume. The supply curve slopes up. Uh, if you want to have producers supply more because they are subject to diminishing marginal productivity, they need a higher price uh, to cover the lower units that are produced uh, per, per input of workers as you increase output. Supply and demand meets, bang, you've got across, everything happens where the lines intersect. That's the micro vision. And then they try to build the macro vision out of an extrapolation of the micro. So they say the aggregate level demand, the total demand in the economy, not just demand in an individual market from all consumers or demand from an individual consumer for all markets. At the aggregate level, they apply the same analysis. And, and, uh, and you'll see them talking about things like rational expectations and um, um, natural rate of unemployment, and natural rate of interest, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all concepts that come out of the mainstream. And again, they treat capitalism at the aggregate level as an optimization system. You, have, you want to get the maximum possible level of utility for all of society at the minimum possible cost, and capitalism achieves that outcome. That's, that's neoclassical. You want one can, of the can, others now? Can, can, well, uh, can I stop you for a sec? You said yeah, marginal sure. cost, right? As marginal mm -hmm. value. Mar Th this idea of marginal value, marginal cost, this came out of the neoclassical uh, approach to economics, yeah. right? So for people who yeah. don't know what that is, that's if I understand what you're saying, 
it's the cost of producing just one more item. So as you produce yeah, in right. a factory, the, uh, producing 10 items will be cheaper or more expensive per unit than uh, say 11 or a thousand. And so the marginal cost yeah. is the cost of that one extra. And as you produce more, you can you can plot these production curves, you know, how much, yep. uh, what the cost is of production. So you, you have these dynamic curves, I suppose, of supply yeah. and demand. And, and the whole idea, if I understand what you're saying, is that there's, you have some sort of uh, static point where, where the supply and demand cross. Uh, and yeah. it, it's a study of that. Yeah. Is this, is this a correct rendition of? It's a correct rendition, but can I use a technical term to describe that model now? Go okay, on. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. <laughs> I, I knew um, this was the word that was going to come. <laughs> <laughs> because when you go and take a look at actual firms, they don't, they're not subject to diminishing marginal productivity. Uh, and this has been found by, I think the latest count is 80 or so surveys that have been done. Every last survey has found that firms do not have diminishing marginal productivity. And the reason, which any engineer listening to this will know, is that engineers are designed by factories to reach their maximum productivity at or very near full capacity. So we've designed them very carefully to be, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're making a giant machine that makes machines that makes goods and services. That's what a factory largely is. And uh, with engineering setting it up, they, 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 uh, the maximum efficiency is almost at capacity and most firms work well below capacity because if you're working a factory at capacity, you don't have enough factories or your factory is too small. So when you do the empirical work, that is exactly like finding craters on the surface of the moon or moons circling Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, when, when you do that, the paradigm should go out the window. But of course, you know, as we know for, for, for certainly a century or so after Copernicus, um, astronomers still clung to the old paradigm, uh, but ultimately they gave it gave way. The, this research about the nature of firms has been done for a, almost a century now. The first surveys went on in about 1936, I think, in America. And it contradicts the theory, but the theory is still taught uh, exactly as it is. So this is why I say it's not a science. If you'd actually had the behavior of a science to find that you've got an empirical discovery, that firms have constant or falling marginal costs, uh, that empirical discovery would have caused a, you know, a scientific revolution ultimately, and the science would have been transformed. Well, that hasn't happened with economics. They're still teaching the same bullshit uh, in the textbooks, uh, despite the fact that we have 80 uh, surveys that have been done that have found that marginal cost does not rise. If we did another 80 surveys, we'd have 160 that found the same result but they don't want to know about it. They don't look at the data and they therefore continuing teaching a fantasy to their students and calling it science. Would you recommend going and doing an economics degree? Sorry? Would you recommend going and doing an economics degree currently given the current? No, no, no. I, I'd say that if you, want, if you want to learn, if you're interested in the economy, then go and do a degree in system dynamics. And then apply what you learn in system dynamics to analyzing the economy and ground yourself in the empirical data. Don't only only use a textbook if you can't keep the door open because it's too windy outside. So, OK, so neoclassical economics that evolved following Marx, right? So so what did he no, not know? After Marx, yeah, after, yeah. in contradiction to Marx. Yeah. Uh, if, if you look back at the history of neoclassical economics, there were proto neoclassicals way, way back in time. So Jeremy Bentham, for example, who is mainly known as a legal scholar, he was one of the, the founders of the philosophy that gave rise to neoclassical economics. Uh, Augustin Cournot, who was a French mathematician, who did some interesting mathematical studies of, uh, of mathematical theories about people's attendance at competing spas. And that's what led to what's called uh, Cournot oligopoly theory and uh, and game theory as well today. And then Jean-Baptiste Say, who was one of the main uh, sort of intellectual counterpoints to Ricardo, he was clearly, the, the I think, the most obvious proto-neoclassical. And that was all about utility maximization, a non-monetary model of the system and so on. And they were the underdogs. They were the uh, people people laughed at uh, in the days when uh, Smith and Ricardo set the nature of economics. So if you read Ricardo, you'll find a phrase at one point where Ricardo says, and this is pretty much a direct quote, uh, it is the ultimately the cost of production which determines 
prices at which God's goods are sold and not, as has often been said, supply and demand. Hmm. So Ricardo was just trashing supply and demand theory. What do we have two centuries later? Supply and demand theory. Hmm. So um, they, they became dominant because the classical school, which came out of Adam Smith and, and David Ricardo in particular, uh, led ultimately to Marx. And then Marx took the classical theory and said that what uh, capitalism generates wealth by exploiting workers. So you then had the whole argument about you know, capitalism should lead to socialism. That was Marx's proposition. He was wrong about that. I'm happy to elaborate why, but nonetheless, that was the background there. So as the time when Marx became uh, a very politi politically significant figure, that was around the time he published uh, Capital, which is 1867. Uh, in that period, 1867 to about 1880, I don't really know the details. I haven't studied the side of it myself properly. I'm sure there are economic historians or historians of economic thought who have. But across that period, the classical school basically went into complete decline in academic circles. And then the neoclassical school took over. So you had three major characters responsible there. Uh, William Jevons in England, um, Leon Volras in France, and uh, Menger, and I can't remember Menger's first name, in Austria. And those three gave us what became neoclassical economics and also the Austrian offshoot, uh, which comes out of Menger's work, which was rather different to uh, Marshall, to uh, Jevons and, and Volras. But Jevons and Volras were all seeing capitalism as a system that achieved equilibrium, uh, where wealth was created by the joint efforts of labour and capital, and they both contributed their own productivity to it. So the marginal productivity of the two came to be seen as to how incomes were determined. Capitalists get the marginal product of capital. Workers get the marginal product of labor. And it's all seen as a very fair system and basically a meritocracy. Now, so that that foundation flipped from Marx saying it's based on exploitation. Mm -hmm. And there are nuances there, but nonetheless, that's a general coverage to cross to saying, well, it's all about meritocracy. People get what they deserve in capitalism uh, and any non-market intervention damages that meritocratic outcome. So we should get rid of trade unions. We should get rid of governments. The anti-government, anti-union side, side of, of neoclassical economics comes out of that foundation as saying that uh, with a free market, with no intervention and no uh, uh, collaboration, between individual agents, you'll get the best possible social outcome. And that's that's what's taught. And I think you can see, to some extent, the ideological component of that. Right. And so how does socialism then compare? So if, if you were going to look at the parameter space of capitalism versus a, a socialist economic system, how, how do they differ in their organization? Well, totally different to what they're actually described in the economic textbooks, nonetheless. But um, again, socialism is seen by the neoclassicals as being um, not having a price system, not using a money system, which is ironic because they the neoclassicals model capitalism without money, but nonetheless, they criticize it for not having a money system, not having a price system, uh, central control, and the a major argument from the Austrians, this is quite valid in my opinion, uh, was that you, a central planner can't possibly work out uh, what the actual distribution of taste and, and output should be to maximize people's utility. That's ironic, by the way, because most, most neoclassical models now include the idea that there is a central planner, but that's that's another little curly. Uh, but they, they will criticize it on that basis. Equally, um, socialists will say, well, you know, this is dominated by an incredibly, uh, capitalist has an incredibly unfair distribution of income. The capitalists get income they don't deserve. Um, so if we have a socialist system, democracy of some description, which of course never happened in socialist countries, uh, can ensure that we get an outcome that actually does maximise people's uh, utility uh, or welfare. Um, and I think that's all. Both arguments are basically pissing in the wind. The person whose work I most appreciate on capitalism versus socialism is actually a Hungarian economist called Janos Kornai. He died about four years ago. But Janos, uh, looking at Hungarian economy and, 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 and seeing how technological development was not happening in the Soviet economies, tried to work out an explanation based on observation and logic 
as to why socialism failed as a production system, whereas capitalism succeeded. And he developed the argument that capitalism is demand constrained, whereas socialism is supply constrained. So he imagined an ideal socialist economy, no Stalin, okay? Mm -hmm. You are actually trying to reach everybody's um, uh, welfare. So you, all, the, all the, the good stuff about, you know, the intentional good stuff about socialism actually occurs, no gulags, et cetera, et cetera. And you said, and of course you're talking in a, a country, economies, economies which are developing, so Marx's vision of socialism was that it would happen in the most advanced countries. Capitalists would have already got all the production worked out. The reality was that it happened in Russia and China and Eastern Europe and so on, which were devastated by the First and Second World Wars and so on. So you had to get these industries developed. You had a drastic need to expand production in every area of the economy, more housing, more food, more clothing more cars, et cetera, et cetera. That meant that every every single sector of the economy uh, was supply constrained. Okay? Mm -hmm. You didn't have enough of these things to begin with. You wanted to produce more of everything in every sector. So consequently, every sector got less inputs than it actually needed to reach its, uh, its necessary production levels required by the five-year plan. And what that meant was your output you, you, you rather than have uh, uh, you, your output did, you didn't have enough uh, factories to make everything you didn't have enough inputs so you supply constraint now in that situation the best way to come close to achieving what the plan requires you to produce is to make last year's model all the time mm. not to innovate put all your resources into maximum possible output minimum minimum innovation mm. and I saw a personal instance of that which is which is sets this in history i had a my girlfriend back when i was in my early 20s her brother uh wanted to buy a 750cc motorbike but he didn't have the money to buy a, a kawasaki or a honda at that time and he then found he could buy a cossack hmm. a motorbike so back in those days buying a 650cc japanese or american or japanese they were they were the dominant models at the time a japanese motorbike would cost you three thousand dollars he literally bought a Cossack for $650, which is $1 per cc, it's quite, quite funny. I helped him, the thing arrived at their house and I helped him unpack it, it was in a wooden crate. We took the wooden crate apart and then there were all these oil soaked rags over the whole thing. We took the oil soaked rags off and there tied down to the bottom of the pallet in all its glory was a 1942 BMW complete with a, a, a motorcycle, a, a, a bicycle seat mm. for the for the sitting on. The sort of thing you'd see in an old Steve McQueen movie, if you know who Steve McQueen is, which we just worked out, no. you probably don't. <laughs> okay. So there was no, no change. They literally stole the design from the Germans. And then they, this is 1972, not 1942. 30 years later, they're still making the same thing. So Cornet's case to me made eminent sense when I first became exposed to his logic. He then described capitalism as being demand constrained. And the idea being there is you've got this dispersed production, there's no centralization whatsoever. A whole bunch of firms who are competing to sell things like motorbikes to a to an um to potential buyers, because you're all trying to compete, you've got excess capacity. This also locks into the whole thing about no such thing as diminishing marginal productivity, because you want to take over sales from your rivals. And the way you compete is not on price, which is the neoclassical nonsense about how you compete. You compete on features. Okay? You come up with some new feature somebody else hasn't got. And therefore, technological development is happening all the time. You're paying workers as little as possible, so you're short of demand, et cetera, et cetera. But the way to get the additional demand from your rivals to, is to innovate. So to me, to me, Cornier's picture of what capitalism was and the socialism was much more realistic, much better descriptions of how they one succeeded and the other failed. Uh, but ironically, the neoclassical theory, when I argue and I agree with him, almost applied the Soviet idea of what factories are like to the real world. You know, working past capacity, uh, su supply constraint, et cetera, et cetera. So neoclassical economists have it asked about TIT. But then, so can, does that mean you can't have a socialist system which is uh, dynamic and innovative? So, for instance, what what happens with China? Um, well, China, China, China actually in many ways exploited Cornet's ideas, okay? because they um, they the, the the central planning. I mean, I, I went to China in eighty one, 
um, I took a bunch of Australian journalists there for a conference with Chinese journalists. And I saw what the production was like at the time and the state of the economy and so on, state of people's living standards. It was appalling. And uh, everything was centrally planned. And then when Deng Xiaoping Xiao came inside, it, it was no longer a plan about what to do. The plan was about the objectives to be met. And they were happy to have innovation occur and, and rival companies coming up in various regions. Uh, and my favorite example of what it was like, uh, what, what where, where it could have gone wrong, was we were taken to a, a furniture factory in Sichuan province. And, and they were a model commune. This is the whole thing they used to do, model communes. And um, and they were making uh, you know, huge sales of furniture, and we were taken to see how good they were. And I asked, "Oh, where are your sales made to?" And they said, "Oh, twenty percent in Sichuan and eighty percent to, to the rest of China." Oh, where do you sell through the rest of China? Oh, Shanghai. Oh, who's your main customer in Shanghai? Uh, how how do you make the sales in Shanghai? And I love this. This is how it was translated, of course. It wasn't spoken in English. We send out propagandists. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally worked out there was one state factory in Shanghai that was directed to buy 80% of their output by the firm. And I thought, well, that means 80% of the sales you can ignore. It's only the 20% they sell locally that makes any sense. So I was very, very skeptical of what was going to happen with their industrialization program. Then we went to the Sichuan Free Trade Zone. Uh, and it was literally, at the time, it was being built. The concrete was being laid by CSR, the Australian uh, Cement Factory Company. And we, uh, after three, we had we loved our Chinese hosts. We had a wonderful time while we were there. But it was amazingly delightful to hear Australian accents from a couple of northern beaches, man and woman, married, married, great personalities. And then we went for a meeting with the, the leader of the, the, the firm that was running the building the free trade zone. And they explained to us that their objective was to get as much American technology as possible, as quickly as possible. Mm. And and they wanted to attract American manufacturers there rather than other other you know, third world countries who were also allowing relocation of production. So they were exploiting a loophole in the American trade laws that meant that if you exported something and re-imported back into America, you didn't pay tariffs on the difference. And they and they had incredibly low wages compared to what he had to pay for American workers and so on. But they had a rule that 80, if we, when you started the factory, you had to have a Chinese partner, regardless of whether the Chinese person could put in any money at all into the factory. And within five years, the Chinese partner had to own 50% of the business. Hmm. Now, think about the huge gap in wages that would make a capitalist, American capitalist, willing to give away half the business. Hmm. Okay? The, the the gap in in what they were paying wages had to be enormous okay to make basically that attractive. slaves okay but that's what they did and then they were just getting hold of the technology as fast as possible because they had a local partner a they got money out of it they didn't the profits weren't all remitted back overseas some stayed in the chinese economy and then also the chinese partner was getting the technology and mm. uh and i thought this is going to work mm. and well obviously it has and they've managed this balance between, as, as, you know, a sort of centrally complained Communist Party run, blah, 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 uh, political system, but while at the same time having effective free enterprise at the and uh, innovation and competition at the level of firms. And of course, a lot of communists became capitalists in the whole transition as well. So they didn't do too badly out of, out of the transition. So China succeeded by tr managing to find a way to combine that innovation with centralized political control and the communist party itself people think about it like a tiny clique of people all stabbing each other in the back which was certainly the case under stalin and under mao uh, but the this, this is going to sound ridiculous but there were a billion people in china at the year that i went there guess how many of them were members of the communist party how many members were, did it have at the time couple million huh couple million 30 million which <laughs> meant that one in every that a first of all under the communist period one in every 30 people you've been talking to could report you to the, to the communist party so you were very stylized about what you believed every last question we asked at the at, and all the we, we did a huge tour of china after having this conference in beijing and every last question we asked the first answer to the question was this is how it was translated 
We followed the directives of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. Okay. Then you'd say what you did. Okay. Um, but every time you had to say you're doing what you were told to do, otherwise you might you know, lose your job or your life. Um, now, that level of political interference is gone, but you still have this you know, huge Communist Party. I don't know what the membership would probably probably 45, 50 million now, I imagine. Um, but the difference is that it's internally, it's internally meritocratic to some extent. So most of the people in the Communist Party weren't economists or lawyers, they were engineers. Mm. And what you have is an engineering mindset that dominates how they try to build the economy. And that's why you know, the, the, the focus on in, incredibly uh, you know, brilliant um, infrastructure building goes on in China, while at the same time as saying, you guys, the, 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 the small firms, get out there and industrialize, and innovate and, and, and build the, the, the products, we'll build the infrastructure. And I, I haven't actually yet been on a high speed Jap a Chinese train. I really regret that I haven't done that yet. Uh, but you know, they've got a, the whole country is covered by a network of high speed trains, incredible technology compared to what you see, you go to America, which one do you think is the third world country? So I've, I've enormous, I've enormous amount of time for what the Chinese have done. And I'm aware of the, the sort of, you know, there's always tension between the Communist Party and the decentralized uh, capitalist production system they have. But it's a it's a creative tension, not the suppression that occurred under Stalin and under under Mao. Um, and in, in many ways, because they know that the Chinese people will revolt if they find that they're situation getting worse there's always an awareness we've got to make sure the bottom level of society accepting those dissidents the bottom level of society doesn't do too badly in america who gives a shit about the poor hmm. so i think in many ways china ends up being more democratic in terms of taking care of its uh, lowest income level people than you find in america one of the aspects of the picture that i don't really understand is so I understand how technology acquisition can help the Chinese economy or helped the Chinese mm -hmm. economy, but I don't understand how overproduction of goods which are not actually used is helpful to the economy. So, so people talk about ghost cities or, or government bodies buying thousands of chairs or whatever it happens to be. How, how mm -hmm. does that piece fit into their success? Or is, it, is that a red herring? Well, it, 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 it's a bit, bit of a red herring, but it's also, I mean, it, it, uh, it's also very valid about their product, their um, uh, housing construction, because <clears throat> the one thing that I haven't mentioned, which is important to mention, is they have a system of distributed system of, of small banks, which are locally managed but sort of centrally owned at the same time, and they've got the credit direction to, to provide credit to entrepreneurs as much as possible. Which you won't, you know, try to get try to get money from a bank as an entrepreneur in America or any any capitalist notion. But in China, it's actually there's pressure on the banking system to provide money to people who they think are going to be innovators and and build successful businesses. So that's that's a major difference there. But they also used uh, private credit to cause a bubble to get them out of the, uh, for the financial crash back in two thousand and eight. So China was a huge beneficiary of the, the bubble economy of America up to and including 2007. And when America hit the recession, uh, I think Chinese exports fell by 40%. It was huge. And the response of the Communist Party was basically to say, lend to anybody for, a, it, it, lend as much money as you can, telling the banks to lend. And that set off a credit bubble, which, which caused these you know, crazy, uh, you know, ghost cities as they're called. And again, I've seen them. Uh, I went to a girlfriend of mine at the time, uh, lived in a um, satellite city of Sichuan called Dayang. And you had, she had a, a lovely apartment in the heart of the city and the city itself felt like a quite um, a prosperous middle-class city in America. It was, standard of living in general was, was quite high, but on the periphery of the city, she'd bought an apartment in, in one of these, um, you know, eight or 10, 30 story towers, hundreds of thousands of apartments overall. And uh, we got there and, and nothing had been finished. You had a knock on the door of the lift to get a lift operator to come down and take you up to the lower level. There was concrete uh, laid, uh, everything was finished in the physical frame, no windows, no doors, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, the, and the, what was going on was this was being financed 
by the um, by the local government selling vacant land to property developers. And then that was revenue for the local government, which led made them to establish a range of local government industries. Uh, but it was all a Ponzi scheme that had to come crashing down. So I'm not at all amazed to see them having that, that impact right now. But again, when you look at the level of the, the technological level of China and the living standard in China, uh, it's been far more successful in, in a short period of time than virtually any other country in history. Because he went from literally people living a peasant lifestyle in 1980 to living in technologically sophisticated and advanced uh, cities now. And of course, there's, there's, there's some inequality, of course, substantial, but the bottom scale, uh, unless you're talking way out in the rural uh, extremes, is nothing compared to the level of poverty you see in America or the UK. So this is a whole other area, but uh, so right now people are talking about colonizing Mars, right? And <laughs> okay, yep. so, so talking about different economic systems in different areas, if we could start from scratch, right? We don't have the momentum of our current economic system in place. If we could start from scratch, what do you think with our current knowledge, what do you think the economic system in play would look like? In Mars? On Mars, as a completely, okay. you've okay. completely dis disconnected from Earth. Okay, well, I actually saw an interesting uh, interview with the Italian man who was leading the, the uh, SpaceX's uh, research into what Mars colony would actually be like socially. And he was asked, uh, you know, what level of inequality would you expect? Is it all virtually none? He said, because if we're going to be building, uh, you know, a colony in Mars, Space is going to be at a premium to begin with. A lot of it's going to be dug under under underground, um, and in that situation, you can't have you know you can't have homelessness, okay? Because if you're homeless, you're going to suffocate with no air to breathe. So everybody has to be housed, uh, and you can't have too much inequality. You can't build you know, gigantic palaces and on Mars and have tiny houses at the other end. Really, if you're lucky, you might get a two or three scale difference between the smallest and the largest abode and there has to be an absolute sense of solidarity and, and communal uh purpose because if you don't all work together you die okay mm -hmm. we've an incredibly unhospitable environment unless we make people feel that everybody is appreciated and everybody is respected and also you've got to contribute at the same time unless that feeling is there you're not going to survive mm -hmm. and you also have to have incredibly high quality technology because like you know you know you're in australia and you know how badly homes are designed in australia all mm -hmm. doors have leaks under them no windows are sealed many of my europeans read this that they never felt so cold as they did in an australian house during winter okay that can't happen on mars it has to be a hundred percent successful lock on every door um so um, in that sense building a society on mars would force us to behave collectively while also innovating. So I think in, in that sense, if we get there, and I desperately hope we do, because I think we're going to fuck up this planet beyond belief. Uh, I don't think civilization is going to continue on Earth, given what we've done to the climate. So I, one of my hopes is we will build that Mars colony before we destroy the capacity to get a colony to Mars uh, in the next 30 years. But it sounds so the picture you paint is sort of early days Mars colony, right? As we develop further and things stabilize on the planet, surely there will be people who can now afford a larger room or you, you don't think there will be hierarchies that develop later on as, as the colony well, there'll, stabilizes? There'll, there'll be a hierarchy to, be, to begin with. But, uh, uh, you know, because if, if Elon Musk uh, manages to die on Mars, as he said, hopefully not an impact. Um, then obviously he'd get a you know palatial residence as palatial as it could be in Mars. But equally, he's a guy who's lived in a forty-five square meter house for some years, uh, you know, while building SpaceX. So I don't think it's not that we're going to get Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Bezos would definitely go for a mansion up there. Um, but I think there's a a sense of sort of um, species adventure and species extension. What's being talked about for people on Mars? So unless you actually felt that you were enabling life to continue off planet uh, then you wouldn't be a colonist there to begin with so i think there's reasons that um you, you'd certainly want to have innovation being rewarded and the individuals getting 
uh, you know, some uh, recompense for coming up with new ideas. And I think it's a necessary thing in a well-functioning society anyway. I'm not not against it at all. But the level of unearned income and unearned wealth that exists on this planet is ridiculous. Um, you know, we will talk about the Jeff Bezos of the world, and uh, but you know, he established Amazon. It, it's it, it's another form of retailing. It's nowhere near as innovative as you know a, a rocket that can land on its backside without blowing up, which is what Musk has done. Um, but it's still an innovation that got him his wealth. But a huge part of the wealth that we have on this uh, planet is simply inherited. I've forgotten the name of the L'Oreal um, uh, heiress, but she's one of the most wealthy people on the on the on the planet. And the only thing she did was come out of the right worm. And like an enormous amount of the of the wealth we see is inherited wealth. It's not something which somebody's innovated. And again, neoclassical theory ignores that by not looking at inheritance. They don't look at how one generation can you know pass on wealth to its offspring and another passes on poverty they don't even consider that element of our current society if they really took their meritocratic argument seriously they'd make sure that when anybody died all their wealth was distributed and in fact they assume that's the case they assume that on the day you die you've spent your last dollar okay you don't pass it on to your kids then another stage they will assume you're uh you you i mean the assumptions of neoclassical economics make a religious textbook look sensible do you, do you draw a so it sounds like you draw a distinction between Elon Musk and then someone who has billions that came from inheritance right should in your view the way the world should work uh, would you place a cap on what people can earn from their own uh, their own business such as Elon Musk how how would you organize a society which you you would think is fair but would have to uh, if you're going to be Capitalism is not a meritocracy, okay? That's mm -hmm. bottom line. Um, so if you wanted to have a society which was a meritocratic one, you'd have to have some form of redistribution tied in. Now, if you look at the way Warren Buffett speaks about his own objectives, is to give away all his wealth by, by the time he dies. And that's his his choice. Now, Buffett has been a successful spare share market, not speculator really. He's better than a speculator, but... That's really what he's done. He hasn't produced any new technology out of that. And by the way, if you see that the restaurant's been recommended by Warren Buffett, do not eat there. Okay, <laughs> the food's boring. I've done it once in New York. Dreadful steak. He um, loves hamburgers, right? And and fast food. So doesn't he so, love hamburgers sorry? and fast and fast food? I don't know, but he he likes steak. And I was we had a choice between uh, Ruth's Chris's Steakhouse, which does the most superb steaks you've ever tasted, and where Warren Buffett went. We chose Warren Buffett, and the steaks were boring. So uh, I wouldn't put the Warren down as a taste taste magnet, but um, bit that bit of a bit of an aside there. But um, to me, if you're going to have a meritocracy, it's got to be designed. It hasn't capitalism hasn't evolved into being one. And neoclassicals have a theory that it is one, but it's theory based on myths. So I, I have an enormous time for innovators. Uh, you know, I'm an innovator myself in in various ways. I haven't made billions out of it yet. Uh, but I have developed software packages and mm -hmm. and and I, I've worked with companies that have made you know innovative computers and things of that nature. so i I really appreciate innovation. I think without it with, without it, we're not human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's vital that we enable that to happen. But you don't want the level of inequality that's come out of the innovation and the allowance for property inheritance to happen in a capitalist economy. And that's where we've gone astray. So let's jump back into the economics then. What is value and how do you measure it? This is probably the ultimate question in in, uh, in uh, economic theory, and it's been wrong, answered wrongly by everybody except and including Karl Marx. Okay? Hmm. So if you, look, if you look at there are two basic strands. One says value is subjective, and that's the Austrian neoclassical position. Another said it's objective, and that's come out of the classical school and also the pre previous school, which is called Physio, the physiocrats. And the idea of subjective utility, as I mentioned before, you know, how comfortable does this chair make me feel subjective? Mm. The objective is, can you sit in it? Yeah. Mm. It's a, you're not trying to maximize it, it just has a functional role. And the neoclassicals regard themselves as more sophisticated, but they, they talk about the subjective utility. But when you do that, you then have a little problem. How do you add up subjective utility? Hmm. Now, that's led to two 
what are called aggregation problems in neoclassical theory, they cannot derive mathematically, uh, they can derive mathematically a theory of individual behavior, an isolated individual, and they can derive a demand curve for an individual out of their concepts, which are called the axioms of revealed preference. And that derives what's called the law of demand that, you know, charge them more for a commodity, uh, you'll get less sales, charge less, you'll get more. They cannot aggregate. Mm -hmm. uh, they, there's, there's what's called the sonnenschein mandel de Burr theorem, uh, which is you can best understand it by reading two papers from the 1950s, one by Paul Samuelson. Can, can I just ask, so that means, yeah. if I'm yeah. understanding correctly, so they can't go from yeah. uh, what uh, microeconomics they, they can't get, up they, to they, macro? They, they, yeah. they, not even that, they can't even get from micro to micro. Because the theory of an individual consumer, got an isolated consumer with a set budget where the change in the price you're considering doesn't change their income. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they can drive a demand curve. When you try to aggregate to get demand for a single market, by definition, a single market is in a national economy. So like the American market for like the bananas involves 350 million consumers. Now, if you change the relative price of bananas, you are going to change incomes. So that point, the fixed point that gives you the point of reference that income doesn't change when you change prices, income must change when you change prices. And that's part of the theory. They, that's part of what they assume. Mm -hmm. But then when you try to aggregate under that rule, when you first of all have prices changing incomes, and you secondly have a definition of an individual consumer that abstracts from their relationship with other consumers. So... The, exactly the same idea of indifference curves and budget constraints is used to describe my behavior as it's, just, it's used to describe uh, Rupert Murdoch's behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, the, not looking at the huge income disparity and the relationships between individuals that enable Murdoch to have that income level. So they leave all that out. But when they do it and they try to derive a demand curve, a market demand curve, they can't do it unless they assume, and this is the price. First of all, they assume all individuals are the same. Okay. But even worse, they assume all goods are the same. So it's mm. it's a, if you know your you you be with the, the training of a physicist, you'd know proof by contradiction. <laughs> that is a proof by contradiction that you can't derive a market demand curve that has the same properties as an individual demand curve. Mm. Now, rather than seeing as a proof by contradiction, they've said, yeah, we'll assume all consumers are the same. We'll assume all goods are the same. Now, next step in the macro. I mean, you look at the stuff and you think, what are you on to let yourself get away with this assumption. Can, so can I ask? Can I ask? Is, yeah. is this? Did these assumptions come into the theory when we didn't have, say, high power computers where we could actually do the calculation? So they're simplifying assumptions that are just grand, grandfathered in. Like, why do we have these terrible assumptions if you can go away and do an experiment like running a factory? No, it's be, be, like I said because it's fulfilling a, a, a religious role rather than a, a functional role. You want to give me a second? I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll load one of the papers I'm talking about and I'll read part of it to you, and I'll sure. give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Well, so give me a sec to get it up here. All right, so I've read so I, I want to get my revenge on <laughs> these bastards. I've read so much garbage by them. I if I can get even certain satisfaction for me. This is Paul Samuelson. Have you the name Paul Samuelson? <clears throat> uh, Probably if I've been reading through your texts, uh -huh. but not okay. not separately. Okay, well, he he is really the guy who created modern neoclassical economics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and it's all, uh, you know, he was effectively a physicist trained who um, uh, went into economics instead. So I'll just actually, I'm going to be looking at another screen to, to, to find the right section of text here okay mm -hmm. so this is, this, is, this is i think this paper is publicly available so we'll record we'll going from here mm -hmm. uh, a paper by samuelson called social indifference curves in 1956 in the quarterly journal of economics which is the leading journal these days and what he's asking is can you aggregate from the individual to the social to be able mm -hmm. to drive a demand curve okay and then he goes through and, and quite sensibly reach a a point where he says um, the common sense of this impossibility theorem is easy to grasp. Allocating the same totals differently among people must generally change the resulting equilibrium price ratio. And this is the punchline, which is correct. The only exception to this is where tastes are identical, not only for all men, 
but also for all men, whether they are rich or, rich or poor. That's true. Okay, mm -hmm. He's proven, he's actually got to the point where he says, logically, we can't aggregate unless we assume all people are the same and all goods are the same. So at that point, he should have said, oh, this is a failure. We can't go any further. We have to change our theory of value. But then he keeps on going, waffles a bit about families and so on. Now I have proved the impossibility of group or community preference curves. Uh, okay. Well, then he gets does, to that, the family. Does, does that mean that he's proved the impossibility that of people having different preferences? What, what does that mean? No, he's proved the impossibility of deriving a demand curve given that people have different ah. preferences. Mm, okay. okay. But he finds he finds an out, <clears throat> and I just I read this and you know I think he. Like I've, I live in Amsterdam and they don't sell drugs that strong here and, that, and there. So we get to this point, he says, um, if within the family, there can be assumed to take place an optimal reallocation of income so as to keep each member's dollar expenditure of equal ethical worth, then we can derive into a family demand, a family uh, set of preferences. The family, this is now back to a quote, the family can be said to act as if it maximizes such a group preference function. The very next line, the same argument will apply to all of society if optimal reallocations of income can be assumed to keep the ethical worth of each person's marginal dollar equal. I don't so he's I'm... assuming yeah. that there's a benevolent central authority that reallocates income inside America so that everybody's happy about the allocation right. of income. Okay. And then you can drive a demand curve. <laughs> you know? you... But, but, okay, so... but. What happens then if so? Maybe maybe it's too difficult to do for going from you know an individual person up to macroeconomics because people are just there's so much diversity in what people who people are. You can have all sorts of uh, different things that you you might want to purchase or sell mm. as an individual. But maybe maybe we should be aggregating and looking. At, so our micro state should be you know. <laughs> um, a city or something like this or, or that it, that is exactly correct and that in fact the only logical conclusion from this is made by a guy called alan kerman happens to be a good friend these days but alan wrote a paper on this saying the only the the, the, the this, this discovery means we may be forced to reason at a level of much higher level of aggregation than the isolated individual and that's completely correct and what that is is saying actually the classical school which had an objective theory of value was correct to work in terms of workers and capitalists and landlords and bankers mm -hmm. and social classes where it makes a certain sense to say, well, um, you know, I'm not the same as Bill Gates, but Bill Gates is probably pretty similar to um, Jeff Bezos. And you aggregate at that level and you have capitalist consumption, worker consumption, banker consumption, and the incomes are also included. So out of that, you get a realistic model. And that's what they should have done at this point. But instead, they wanted to hang on to the individual as a foundation to work from subjective utility and so on. And they just made these ridiculous assumptions to keep on going. And that's where the idea of the social planner has come from. And you'll find a lot of economic players will say, the social planner chooses such blah, blah, blah. The social planner becomes this idea of what they call a representative agent, where one individual mm. represents the entire society. And what that one individual does maximizes utility for the whole of society. It's, it's They've got themselves tied up in logical conundrums. You know, it, it's just ludicrous to read that stuff these days and take it seriously. But because students come in at a, a young age and go into it, if, you, if you're slightly antisocial and you're a bit of, you think you're a mathematics geek, you can keep on doing this stuff and think you're doing season and science, but it's it's worse than epicycles. At least with epicycles and equants and deference and so on, the Ptolemaic astronomers could predict pretty accurately where the planets were going to be for the next few hundred years. These guys can't get uh, you know next year's economic performance right or last year's for that matter. So um, that's why I see it having a, like a religious component to it for anybody to believe this stuff today. The epicycles were essentially Fourier analysis, right? In some sense. So it's not crazy that they were able to derive. Uh, anyway, that's that's a completely different topic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I ask then, if, if we don't have a well-grounded theory of economics, or at least economists don't have a well-grounded theory of economics, yeah. then how how is it that they can manage the economy effectively? They don't. They don't manage it all, all well. I mean, this is like if you saw, if you 
if you lead up to the financial crisis in 2007, they didn't see it coming. In fact, their predictions about 2008 was going to be a great year. So mm. if you read, my, my favourite one there is by the OECD. If you look at the OECD's uh, economic outlook in 2007, you'll find the opening is called Achieving Further Rebalancing. And they say the economic situation we're facing is better than we've experienced in years. Our central condition, central prediction is indeed quite benign. And so there's going to be uh, rising growth and falling unemployment. Mm. I got it completely wrong. Now, I'm one of the dozen or so, probably two dozen overall economists who predicted chaos in 2007 and 8, not, not, um, not stability. Mm. And the reason is I focus upon the role of credit. I looked at the level of private debt, saw that it was rising dramatically quickly in America in terms of compared to the historical level, and the level of debt, private debt, was huge. And I said, when that turns around, and it will turn around, there'll be a downturn, and it'll be the worst in the in the uh, post-war period because we haven't had a level of debt this high in the whole post-war period. So I I predicted because I focus on something that they say you don't have to look at to be an economist. Hmm. So yeah, it, it's. It's an, it's amazingly messed up, and they get away with it because capitalism has a momentum to it. So you know, so long as you're on an up, upward swing of the economy, that will probably continue, but there will be a turning point. They can get the upswings, they can never get the turning points, and and um, and their models are that they talk about forward-looking agents in their models, but the models are backward-looking. Uh, they look at you know past data and try to fit fit behaviour to the past data that they've got. Um, so they, they don't have a, a, a sound understanding of capitalism itself. And if capitalism was like engineering, where a capitalist had to build the economy for it to work, uh, and like engineers have to build a bridge for it to exist, there'd be so many dead people that we would have got them reformed decades ago. But economists get away with their garbage because they're, they're not essential for the functioning of capitalism. Can, can I push back a, a little bit and uh, ask... You know, a lot of people make predictions, right? Mm. So you famously made this prediction of the 2007, 2008 crash. Why should we trust you if you make another prediction uh, for the for the future? Um, because, of, co of course, with, with all the economists in the world making all their different predictions, there's always going to be someone who's correct. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. Um, w why should I trust you? Well, what I'm trying to do is build a foundation that lets lets people say this is based on incontrovertible foundations. And you talked about you know building macro from micro beforehand, which is what they've done for a long, long time. So they have a they have a, a theory which has been empirically falsified of what firms do. Equally, their theory of consumers has been empirically falsified, and they try to build a model that will predict capitalism on that foundation. When at the same time, they're not aware of complexity. They've got aggregation issues that get in the way to begin with. So, you know, they're on, they're on a hiding to nothing to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. The only thing that saves them is the level of statistics that they can apply and get statistical trends out of the data and get that right. I'm trying to say, let's actually work from macroeconomic definitions. Mm -hmm. So, if I, And so if I define the employment rate, that's the number of people with a job divided by population. The wages share of GDP is wages divided by GDP. The private debt ratio is debt divided by GDP. The government deficit is government spending net of taxes divided by GDP. Now, you can't disagree with the definitions. Right? They're absolutely mm -hmm. correct. I then put that together in a simple model, and I get things like the financial instability hypothesis coming out of it, predicting that if you have a runaway level of private debt, you'll have a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so it is that's what I'm trying to do in terms of building a and trying to build a, what could eventually be a science of economics, which is based on absolutely inconvertible foundations and and gets rid of all the waffle and ideology that's been built into neoclassical economics as a result. Now, I know that I'm not going to get all of that uh, causal factors right, but a large part of it ends up with me saying, well, you have to look at the monetary system. Now, one ironic thing most people are going to get a shock out of if they don't know economics is that economists, macroeconomic models do not include money or banks or debt. Okay. So they leave all those out. Now I look at them. Okay, I, I don't look at them on a daily basis because I'm busy building, you know, alternative theories, and I'm particularly focusing on the garbage economists written on climate change. 
which I think is going to end up in capitalism being destroyed because of their stupid ideology. But looking at, for example, looking at the most recent numbers for America credit, credit's now turned negative in terms of bank lending in America. I think because of the impact of the high interest rates they put in to try to control inflation. And if the government also simultaneously takes the advice of economists and tries to reduce the deficit, the deficit of what creates fiat money, the new borrowing, net borrowing, rather than net debt. The gap between new loans and new loan repayments is what creates credit money. Credit money is looking like it's going negative for America, like with literally the last uh, six months. You have negative credit coming in, and the government also tries to reduce its, its deficit, then you're going to have less money turning over in the economy and probably a downturn. Okay. Hmm. I'm not going to be definitive about it, but I, I wasn't. I was expecting this to be the result of putting up interest rates as much as they've done uh, over the last two years, supposedly to fight inflation. And but I was, we think well, it has to have an impact on government lending at some point, and that could be a policy-induced credit crunch. Well, it hasn't happened rapidly in America because American mortgages are the, the main form of debt these days, mm -hmm. and American mortgages are normally fixed term, so people don't feel the impact. People with current mortgages don't feel the impact of rising interest rates until they have to re renegotiate their loan or sell and buy a new one. So it's much more lag than it is, say, in the Australian case, where the vast majority of loans are floating rates. So if interest rates go up, your mortgage rate goes up the next week. Um, so it's been it's slowed in America, but it looks like it's biting now. So that's one prediction I'm willing to make and say that, given my orientation, I expect a downturn in America, whereas for the last two years, or three years, they've been boosted by huge fiscal spending. Hmm. So, uh, but but I, I, I don't think you should take even my predictions seriously yet, because we don't yet have what I'd regard as a decent science. Okay, hmm. I mean, Again, what I'm building, you know, like Galileo's first telescope, you wouldn't try to spot the Andromeda galaxy using that. A lot more sophistication is necessary. But uh, I do have ex-students of mine uh, and colleagues of mine who are now starting to build enormous models based on the ideas that I've established using the software I've created called Minsky. So I, I do hold out some hope of being able to make reasonable predictions in future. But certainly one thing I'd come out of that saying is we shouldn't let the level of private debt be anywhere near what it is. Private debt is probably three times higher than it should be. Mm -hmm. So I'd be making arguments about how we need to you know, fix up past mistakes that have been made because we swallow neoclassical economics. I'm more interested in doing that than I'm trying to predict where the economy is going to go next year. What makes private debt special as opposed to public debt? Public debt is money creation. And this is, this is uh, well, you would have heard of modern monetary theory. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so MMT, people see it as a policy prescription. It's actually trying to describe the actual structure of money creation by the government at the moment. So when the government runs a deficit, it does not borrow from the public. Okay, uh, the, the vision of the neoclassical have it does borrow from the public. They're completely wrong. When you do the accounting, uh, what actually happens is governments, when government spends in excess of taxation, it means it's putting more numbers into your bank bank account than it's taking out. Those numbers we call money. Okay, so a government deficit creates money. Because we're working in a double entry world, the accounting is double entry, the increase in the liabilities of the banking sector has to be offset by one of two ways. Either another liability goes down when that liability goes up, but that would be the case where there's no government sector, or an asset of the banking sector goes up at the same time as its liability goes up. When you're looking at government spending, the liability that rises, we call them reserves. They're probably better at a guide as, as settlement accounts, but they're the bank accounts of the private banks at the central bank. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they go up. So when when the what happens then, those reserves actually used to earn no interest. They now are paid an interest rate after the financial crisis because uh, the Fed created so many more reserves in quantitative easing uh, that they had to offer an interest rate to have people hang on to the reserves. Of banks hang on to the reserves, but normally bonds, a, a bonds used to earn positive interest rate reserves were nothing. Now bonds get a higher interest rate than reserves get. So when the government says we're going to sell bonds equivalent to the deficit plus outstanding interest payments, 
that is an offer to exchange these originally non-income earning assets on the banking system's leisure for income earning assets. Well, you have to be a fucking idiot to turn down the offer. Okay. Mm. Now, instead we come and say, well, people won't buy the bonds. Well, actually that may happen now because of the mess, the mess that the Federal Reserve's made of bonds by putting up interest rates. It's mm -hmm. another story. But before, when interest rates were either stable or trending down, when you bought the bonds, you got an interest rate, interest bearing asset in place of a non interest bearing asset. And if rates were falling, the value of those bonds were rising. So the previous regime of either stable interest rates or falling interest rates meant that bonds were a completely safe purchase and you swapped a non-income earning safe asset for an income earning safe asset. Mm -hmm. That's what bond sales are. They're not borrowing at all. They're repurposing um, or, or mm -hmm. reclassifying an asset on the banking system ledger from non-income earning to income earning. Mm -hmm. So of course the bonds are going to be purchased. So that's money creation. When you look on the private side, uh, when the gov when the when a when a bank lends to you, that puts more money in your account, obviously. So you, you have a rise in your asset, but simultaneously, the asset that goes up on the banking sector side is your debt to the bank. Mm -hmm. So you have an increase in your your assets of the bank account, but your liability is the debt, and they both go up simultaneously. So you have no net money creation, no as no net asset creation out of that. Your equity doesn't change. Whereas when the government runs a deficit, it's putting more money into your deposit account with no offsetting liability for you. Okay. So therefore, at your at individual level, when the government runs a deficit, your private equity increases precisely as much as the government's equity falls. So understanding all these issues is vital to knowing how a capitalist economy functions. And neoclassicals, A, get it wrong, and D, don't even look at it anyway. They have a totally myth mythical and false model of bank lending. And, and therefore, they, that's why they don't see any problem with private debt. But in fact, when you look at the accounting itself and you look at the economic history, every last major crisis in capitalism's history has been caused by a private debt bubble. And this is work not done by me in this case empirically, but done by an ex-banker, now philanthropist called Richard Vague. He's the least vague person I know, by the way. I find it quite funny that his name is Vague. We want to write a book to the Keen and Vague would be a great combination for uh, <laughs> editors of a book. But um, Richard got his staff to go through not just like economic data, but newspapers and government reports from the seven major economies around the world over 150 years. They identified 150 uh, economic crises in that period of time. Every last one was caused by a private debt, debt bubble bursting. Hmm. So I look at that. That's you know, my analysis. I've developed Minsky to make it possible for people to analyze that logically. And that's one reason you should trust me more than a neoclassical. <laughs> so it, so in, in the 2007, 2008 crash, uh, famously, so banks took on these toxic assets, right? They would lend mm. to someone who couldn't ever have any hope of paying back, for instance. Mm. And yeah. then the central authorities stepped in and bought up those, essentially bought up those toxic toxic assets, right, from the banks. In themselves. America, yeah. In America, yeah, through um, through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, yeah. So one, one question I have is, why buy at the level of the bank and not the individual who has the loan with the bank? Right. Why, why did it make sense to go mm -hmm. at the level of the bank? Well, because they had to. They, they didn't have a way of buying, of buying the debt off the individual householder. Um, so like if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can buy government bonds and they can buy mortgage-backed securities and things of that nature. And people like Janet Yellen thought that that was going to be uh, get rid of risk in the economy. Mm -hmm. Distributing. Now, friends of mine like Doug Henwood and a, a few others, Doug Noland, um, saw this as a huge government backed bubble. So it, because the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were buying mortgage backed securities off the distributors of these things, which are both banks and you know non bank agents, that's where uh, what's that's that classic movie about it? Um, um, I've forgotten the actual name. With the, the, the Dick Capriccio being one of the stars. Um, I'm terrible with cultural references. <laughs> yeah, okay, anyway. Okay, forget it. <laughs> anyway um, uh, the big short, the big short. I ah, met everybody yeah, okay, in the big I short. I actually know this okay. one, yeah. Okay. 
and they could just see that this was a huge bubble that was going to burst at some point. Um, so you had a, a private financial system creating speculative vehicles like you know credit default swaps and things of that nature, mm -hmm. using economic theory to slice it up and dice it and presumably get rid of the risk. And you can't securitize away risk. You simply locate it somewhere else. So it was mistaking an episodic system for a systemic system. The system had to fall over at some point. And the, the government, because it's led by people who are as naive as neoclassical economists, okay, uh, they swallowed all this stuff. So if you look at the, the big short, the book itself rather than the movie, mm. goes through the mechanics here quite quite well because the ratings agencies the staff and the ratings agencies look up to the people who run the big banks mm -hmm. look up to the fed and there's all this sort of ego and envy stuff going on there and as one of them said we when we in in the big shot it's quoted at some point is saying we we we'd, we'd uh, uh, securitize a cow turd if they paid us enough money for it so you, you the whole thing because it was based on people paying to be verified that they were uh, responsible Pay them enough money. Yeah, you're responsible. The name's Donald, isn't it? Interesting hairdo. Uh, you know, they, they, it was just built for corruption. And the whole system, the government ended up being underwriting a corrupt Ponzi scheme, which had to come crashing down despite the government's backing. I'm just looking at the time and I, I realize we have to wrap yeah. up uh, soon. So I wanted to really touch on um, the impact of the economy on the environment. Uh, mm. So if we could jump into that just to, to wrap up the discussion, you yeah. have a view of value that's based on energy, as far as I understand. Uh, yeah, fundamentally, we have to include energy in our theory of production. And the, the, the last economic school of thought that did that was the physiocrats back in the 1700s. So you fundamentally, I see what we, we call value in the real world, the physical value, is the manifestation of exploiting free energy. I see. And and so and the evidence of that, of course, is that if you look at the GDP of any country and their, um, let's say, carbon output, they're sort of one to one mapping right between the two. Not quite one to one at the individual country level, because, of course, relocation of production has made it possible to shift the production to one place and the consumption somewhere else. But at the global level, it's crazy. If you take a look at this, there's a World Bank data series where they put GDP in American terms and they have a figure for global global uh, gross world product as opposed to gross domestic product. And then there's an OECD series which maintains energy usage, again, having a one for the total global consumption of energy. When, when you plot the two, not only are they roughly correlated, uh, the correlation coefficient for energy at the global level against gross world product is 0.997. Now, partly that's collinear. They're both increasing. So, of course, the fact they're both rising will give you a biased correlation coefficient. But the correlation of the change in GDP to the change in energy is 0.86. Hmm. Now, that's just astronomically close at a globe. For the, something as, you know, data across the globe over 50 years, that's data going from 1960 to about 2010, 2020, uh, it's ludicrous that you can, it's so close. And the only way to interpret that is to say that fundamentally, what we do is take energy and turn it into useful work. And that is the thermodynamic understanding of value, which I think is essential to have a realistic economics. D does that unify all the other concepts of value? So if, uh, utility or uh, what I, you know, both subjective and objective, it, it's all encapsulated underneath this physical. It, it, it brings it to it brings it together. I mean, I, I, I start with an objective theory of value because, again, the fact that there is free energy on the planet is not any human created. It's the whole you know, conservation of the first, the first law of thermodynamics. And we exploit what's available uh, to create a society which consumes more energy per head than is possible for animals, okay? mm -hmm. other animals. So that's why our civilization comes from that. And that's subjective. You can measure that in joules. Okay. That and then the more we expand it, the more uh, you know uh, conversion of energy into useful useful energy uh, is feasible. So the objective foundation makes absolute sense. But Marx developed a theory of value which contradicted the labor theory of value, and he buried that. Didn't want that result because that got rid of his 
argument about an inevitability of socialism. But if you get rid of the labor theory of value stuff, you've got a, a sound theoretical foundation for starting from an objective theory of value, which begins with the exploitation of free energy. But does this mean essentially we're stuffed in that we just have to stop consuming? We have to we have to lower our quality of life because there's some sort of a relationship between our quality quality of life and the damage we're doing? Or can is there some way that a, a better understanding of economics, for instance, could or uh, technology development uh, could get us out of this uh, position that we're currently in? If we'd started moving 50 years ago, we could have got out of it. Okay? This is when the Limits to Growth was published back in 1972. Uh, and the Limits to Growth basically said if you put a systemic view of the global system together based on data, and very good data from 1900 to 1970, that's how they set the model up, uh, then they predicted a uh, overuse and, and downturn if we continue to what we now call business as usual trajectory. And they really said, you've got to redirect everything. If we start doing it in 1975, we'll be able to avoid a crisis. And they were dead right. Instead, we were told not to take them seriously, courtesy of economists. And absolutely critical in that was William Nordhaus. His first claim to fame was trashing the foundation model for the limits to growth, which is called World 2, done by Jay Forrester one of the world's great engineers, greatest engineers. Mm. Um, he trashed that work, abused it, ridiculed it, didn't understand it. And so Limits to Growth became a pop thing. You know, hippies read it, not serious people. But it was put together by bloody engineers at MIT with incredibly detailed work. The, the, the textual book um, of the data fitting they did was only published a couple of years after they put out the Limits to Growth. I wish they'd reversed the order. But the book is a, like about a 700-page tome of, of all the consultations they did with experts in agriculture, population, imagine manufacturing and so on to fit those various curves to the data. And they basically said, if we direct this forward now, looking at the systemic relationships between all those elements, resources, manufacturing, health, et cetera, et cetera, we can't see anything but chaos hitting us in 20, between, they, they deliberately, if you look at the graphs and the limits to growth, the first number is 1900, the second is 2100. They deliberately did not put numbers on the on the x-axis because they were not making a prediction with a particular date but if you look at the curves roughly 20 2020 to 2030 is what they see us getting into serious trouble so, so what if we don't had they, they had a thermodynamic understanding in other words of where mm -hmm. we are and if we'd taken them seriously we could have avoided being in a crisis now instead we took economists seriously i have no bloody idea about the thermodynamic limits on the planet the resource limits and so on and we're going to have catastrophe coming out of that. But what would you do? So so if we could go back 50 years and implement some economic policy, what would that actually look like? So um, if, if, you, if you had control of the levers, how do you develop a system which uh, avoids ecological disaster, but nonetheless builds in wealth and, and prosperity in, in, into the human population? There's a whole lot of controls involved in doing that. Oh, you know, that's that's covered in the original Limits to Growth book. One of them is population control. We we could not allow population to reach the level it is now. With back when Limits to Growth was written, I think there were three billion people. Now there are eight. Okay, mm -hmm. so we've in, in that sense, although it almost trebled the load on the planet, the energy consumption per head is almost doubled. So we've got four to five times the load on the planet, maybe more, that we're doing back in 1970, 75. So they said we have to constrain energy. We have to direct more to, away from manufacturing towards services. Uh, you know, so rather than look, look, if you look at a car in 1970 and compare it to a car in 2020, the car in 2020 weighs about twice as much as the one in 20, 1970. We've added features, added size, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we've, we've, we've followed a manufacturing emphasis in increasing the size, the scale, the power, et cetera, et cetera. I drove in cars in the 1970s. They could get you from A to B. Okay. Mm -hmm. You didn't need, uh, li quite, quite literally, a mate of mine and I could pick up a car in the 1970s, the Mini. Okay. We actually had to get a car into a parking space once. So we lifted it in. We're both mm -hmm. weightlifters. Long story, but it was feasible. Imagine doing that with a replacement for the Mini these days. You couldn't do it, okay? So we've actually increased the weight of everything, increased the mass, increased the energy, et cetera, et cetera, rather than saying, let's do this more slowly 
And then at the same time, let's also do as much as we can to change away from fossil fuels. Okay. So we could have done all these redirections of how manufacturing and net consumption uh, went over time. And don't let inequality reach the scales it has. That was also, I think, in the Limits to Growth report. And they we imagine that we could reach by 2020, uh, now, 2050, or 2020. We could reach a world where the average standard of living was three times higher than it was in 1970. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that would have been a serious redirection and some planning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole fact that it would mean planning, coordination, obviously population control goes totally against the idea of individual freedom. Okay. Uh, but it said, well, we're not individuals. We're a collective living on the surface of a planet, which is a physical size, has particular physical resources, a biosphere, you know, at level of atmosphere, we can measure where there's air. We know what the pollution, we are in a, and until such time as we live on a planet the size of Jupiter or larger, there's a collective element to our behavior as well as individual. And by suppressing the whole issue of collective and pushing the individual, we got pushed into this massive level of overconsumption, which will now bring our economy unstuck because the climate will start changing, is changing a hundred times faster than it does naturally and in the direction that will lead to potential, um, if not extinction, then certainly destruction of our sedentary civilizations. But does that mean that you would have to impose changes in sort of a top-down, centralized, authoritarian manner? Or, or can you build incentive structures into uh, sort of a more free, what we would view as a more free sort of market economy? I think you need some level of authoritarian. I'm sorry to say, okay. I'm 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 a total libertarian in my own personal behaviour and what I've done over my life. I've done I haven't followed any you know particular constraints. So I appreciate the feeling of, of freedom that libertarians have, but they don't see the systemic consequences of that, and I'm quite aware of the systemic consequences. So I think we we have to have uh you know, like we 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 would have set for example global targets on energy consumption mm -hmm. global targets and how much that energy was fossil fuel versus um uh, uh solar or nuclear and we would have set that we would have you know, allowed individual uh innovation within those socially set constraints which would be like what the chinese have done but with a growth focus rather than a social constraint focus uh, and it would have taken a realization that until such time as we take production off planet, uh, then we are necessarily an individual is not isolated. We're linked by the climate and the biosphere in which we live. And so the authoritarian would, the only way to get around the authoritarian is to get collective agreement that we live in a system. We're not isolated. Mm. And the feedback of the system, if we, if we don't, if we don't take account of the fact that we are in a global system, and we try to behave as crazy individuals, we'll end up precisely where the fuck we are, which is on the verge of the system breaking down and wiping us out as individuals. So let me wrap up with just one more question that's related to this, yeah. uh, bearing in mind your time. Okay, so, so we're doing some damage to the environment with under our current system, but do we live better lives than we did 70 years ago, 50 years ago? In other words, are, yeah. d d given that we have this level of destruction, are we at least better off than our parents were? Oh, yeah, we are. Absolutely. And and like the, the Buckminster Fuller, Fuller put the best expression about this. We have a huge number of slaves each. Okay. Mm -hmm. We've all got an enormous slave workforce that is doing most of the work for us. That slave being fossil fuels. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Buckminster Fuller, you'll actually find a wonderful cartoon somewhere on the web that illustrates this, because apparently he got the insight when stuck in a traffic jam somewhere in, I think it was a city in Canada. And he then sort of idly imagined, you know, with all these stuck cars, engines turning over, how many slave equivalents are pushing each car. And he worked out it was about, each of us had about 500 slaves pushing us forward. So that and now we might have a thousand slaves each pushing us forward mm -hmm. so you know we, we're, we're definitely better off because we're consuming more energy okay? mm -hmm. and we're using energy to do more interesting things uh, and and like the the level i mean the fact that you know, 
you're we're both in Europe at the moment, of course, but we could have this call. You could be in Australia and I could be here. We'd both be in lighted rooms with plenty of light coming in because we've got electricity. So it, it's we're definitely better off for consuming more energy, but we're consuming more energy at the at the price of the sustainability of the biosphere. And that's the mistake we've made. Just on that calculation, so if I go and do work in my backyard, I shovel some dirt or something, I put out a certain amount of, I, I can perform a certain amount of work. Is the calculation done by comparing how much um, energy is in a lump of coal or something? Or in a, sorry, in this case, it would be a barrel of oil. Is, is that just a direct uh, value comparison? Yeah, it's a direct value comparison. You actually find Nate Hagen has done some good work on that, and so has Tom Murphy. Um, if you want to interview somebody who's really quite fascinating with his analysis, get Tom Murphy on, the physicist Tom Murphy. And when you look at the Thursa laws of thermodynamics, and I'm aware of them, I don't know how to work with them. Tom certainly is both aware and knows how to work with them. He made the calculation that over the period from 1650 to today, the energy uh, consumption has increased by 2.9% per year. Hmm. Now, if we continue to 2.3% per year from now on, so we're not talking exaggerated, we're talking less than we've averaged so far, then that means every 100 years, you increase the amount of energy consumed by a factor of 10. Now, if we have four more centuries where we increase current energy consumption by 10, factor of 10 per century, at that point, we will, we will raise the, by thermodynamics alone, forget about global warming, just simply waste heat necessarily generated and exploiting energy the average temperature of the biosphere will be 100 degrees celsius so that that's even if we had if we ran everything off um renewables let's say it, yep. just yep. just the okay the simple second law of thermodynamic not simple it's com com complicated but the straightforward calculation of the second law of thermodynamics you hit 100 degrees and i think it's in tom's book i think it's in 417 years time I, I said of that course was we won't get there. We'd be, yeah. yeah. I, I, I said this, that was the last question, but do you have time for just one more? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So th this is something that I've been curious about, and I've ne I've not heard anyone talking about this before. But I think you might be the perfect person to ask the question uh, too. Mm -hmm. so we're currently going through a phase where we're developing artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. And people often worry that. People will be outcompeted. They they all jobs will be taken over um, because it's just cheaper to run a machine. So th th this is a constant. Th this is a this is currently something that's discussed. But what is not discussed is uh, something else that I'm curious about. What impact do you think? artificial intelligence will will have in terms of its consumption so let, let's say for example you have a highly intelligent a super intelligence which is now a consumer not just a producer but it, it buys stuff as well in the market um and, uh. and so it buys things that humans have no interest in i don't know or you know um oil for its parts or something i'm not sure exactly what, what it's going to be interested in but what impact will artificial intelligence have as consumers on, on, on the markets? And, and what impact will that have on what humans are able to buy? Well, there, I think you've gone past artificial intelligence and jumped into artificial imagination. Oh, come because, on. <laughs> because, I mean, like we're looking at it at the moment, I'm looking at things like Tesla's bot, for example, uh, which looks like it's going to be the most advanced robot pretty soon on the planet. And if far more likely to be used for production and they are for consumption. Mm -hmm. The only way they're going to be used for consumption is they get a sense of self, like a self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Then you're talking Terminator. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, if we, I, I don't think we're going to get there. I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm okay. a skeptic about the potential to get genuine self-aware artificial intelligence, which is what you're really talking about. Uh, but if we do, um, I have the sort of ambivalent feelings about it. I don't think we're intelligent enough collectively to understand what we're doing in a systemic way. And I think we're gonna wipe out a capacity to keep the knowledge we've built. That's the, the biggest fear that I have about the future isn't the deaths that I expect from climate change. And I would number those deaths in the billions. Uh, my real fear is gonna lose all the knowledge we've accumulated over the last 2000 years and certainly particularly over the last 
250 years. Mm -hmm. uh, if any human, if humans survive, and humans probably will survive what's coming, but in isolated pockets, um, we're going to go back to a level of technology, if we're lucky, of the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And we're going to forget all the stuff we've learned. And that, to me, is the greatest tragedy of all. Knowledge got us where we are, and abusing that knowledge is going to destroy us. So that that's my greatest fear. So if artificial intelligence come along and maintain the knowledge, like the type of intelligence you're talking about, which is artificial self-aware intelligence, uh, then there's a chance for the knowledge we've accumulated to not die out with us. So I actually like the thought of Terminator in that sense. <laughs> uh, but hopefully they don't give it to us as brutally as uh, as Arnie Schwarzenegger tried to do. Um, so, you know, I have a real sympathy. I mean, I really do hope we actually manage to achieve artificial self-aware intelligence, but I can't see that happening. Um, maybe at all, and maybe in our lifetimes. And what's happening instead is the development of, of trainable uh, artificial intelligence without self-awareness, and they will be the ultimate docile factory workers. Hmm. And therefore, all the people who get their jobs out of mundane uh, skills right now will not have a job. And equally, even at the other extreme, diagnosis by one of the by an AI will be far more effective than diagnosis by most doctors because we doctors simply can't keep the range of potential diseases in their head that can cause symptoms. We'll talk about um, legal drafting will be another area where you know you won't hire a lawyer to do your will. You'll get an AI to do it for you. Mm. It's highly unlikely anything you do require a leap of imagination by an AI to make out your will. So there's anywhere that doesn't evolve imagination will no longer generate employment. And therefore, the, the capacity of the working class has had to bargain for a share in the energy we exploit on this planet will disappear. Mm -hmm. So the only way to get around that is a universal basic income. Yeah. But how... You have to give everybody enough to survive, and then you get more if you innovate. But uh, we don't, you know, we don't let people die because they're not innovators. But who will have the power to enforce UBI? If imagine you have a scenario where now the net value of all humanity becomes negative, let's say because we're just outproduced by machines. Uh, mm -hmm. Negative in the sense that we, uh, like, like you might um, place the val if you're going to place value on on humans, you might say that someone who was destructive to the the society was had negative value. Mm -hmm. Say, who would have the power to enforce UBI in that case? Has to be a collective decision. It has to be willing to say that as a, as a species, we want to make sure nobody in our species uh, has insufficient income or services to be able to live I'll give you a little analogy here which i find quite remarkable uh, a bunch of solomon islanders who literally living in huts in the you know, solomon islands reaches were brought to australia uh, for a experience of seeing what an advanced society is like and they were walking through surrey hills and they found this person just sitting on the you know on the street lying on the street and they asked the interviewer, the person who was putting the documentary together, what's that person? Why are they like that? And the, uh, the uh, documentary producer said, oh, they're homeless. And so the Solomon artist says, what's homeless? And they had it explained to them. And they were incredulous. They said, you let somebody live like that? Why don't you make them a house? And so ironically, this documentary was supposed to be about Solomon artists experiencing an advanced society, turned into a documentary about the Solomon Islanders establishing a charity to support the homeless in australia now the whole fact that we will you know i've i walk past homeless people particularly when i'm in london or in america not so much thank god europe uh homeless people all the day all the time and i think you know you can give them a bit of your money but it, you know they're going to be there the next day uh it's awful and, and yet as a society we tolerate that that's appalling that's a disgusting element of, of modern civilization. So we should get to the stage where we say, whatever somebody's mental state, whatever um, low intelligence they might have or low capacity to work or handicaps and so on, we have to make sure that everybody is able to live. And then you can go above that level if you're an innovator or you know a hard worker or an elite sportsman or whatever else. But we at least provide 
enough for everybody. So, you know, that's why I'm a proponent of a universal basic income and universal basic services as well, uh, rather than like a lot of modern monetary theory people are anti that and pro job guarantee. To me, a job guarantee is going to go out the window as soon as something like a Tesla bot can replace 90% of unskilled labor. And I think by the looks of it, in terms of the, not the number of bots, but the capability of those bots, I think they're probably going to hit that capability in the next two years. So for that, my, my way of thinking, we have to start politically talking about a universal basic income with universal basic services rather than a job guarantee. Well, Steve Keen, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you.